Welcome to TD Synex's 30 Minutes with a Hacker. Welcome everyone to 30 Minutes with a Hacker. This is Jade Whitty with TD Synex, and I'm excited to have with me here today Brett Scott and Alex Ryle, both of them have been with me for many of the uh, previous episodes and Brett actually from the very beginning on every one. So we love tapping his brain and it's been great having Alex join us as well. As we break into this, maybe Alex and Brett, you can both introduce yourselves and a little bit about your background. Love to. Thanks again for the invite, Jade. Uh, my name is Alex Riles. I'm the global security leader for TD Cinex, meaning I'm responsible for all the vendors that uh, we sell in the security space across uh, Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific. Uh, background in a lot of technology and software development and, um, and certainly cybersecurity, but uh, really glad to be here. My name is Brett Scott. I'm a director level here at TD Cynics. I oversee the Tech Data Cyber Range. I'm also the founder of the National Cyber Warfare Foundation. Just to kind of get into this, this discussion, Microsoft was hit with a DDoS attack pretty major. And I'd love to get you guys' take on that. Just what, what are your initial thoughts? You know, it's amazing that we get these examples all the time about a really well-resourced organization with a really robust network. Uh, and we see that even those folks are being taken off of line by malicious attacks. So if you're an organization smaller than Microsoft, and that's a pretty long list of folks, if it's happening to them with all their resources, with all of their investments and all of their cybersecurity, uh, imagine what would happen to you under the same circumstance. And if you think, well, they will attack Microsoft, but they won't attack me, that's incorrect. Don't make that assumption. Uh, you absolutely are going to face an ever-growing set of cybersecurity threats, and you are being given the, the uh, ability to foresee what's coming in your direction by observing what's happening to some of the bigger players that are out there. Yeah, I think that Microsoft breach was really interesting. It was a DDoS attack, and uh, Microsoft later said that 25, they've noticed a 25% increase in DDoS attacks uh, just in the first half of 2021, which is pretty scary, especially for all of our partners out there who are working hard to try to protect their customers. So the question is, what can our channel do to provide processes and tools and technology to, to their end user customers to protect them from these kinds of attacks and all the other types that are out there as well. And I, one of the things that really comes to mind for me is security orchestration. I think that too many customers focus on buying a lot of cool tools and gadgets, but they don't integrate them together very well. They don't speak um, to each other and translate data uh, across tools. And then they're not automating the response to these attacks. And that's really what security orchestration sort of is. You know, there, there's been a really big drop in the available cybersecurity talent for organizations. Last November, almost a year ago, uh, we saw uh, a survey come out that said 85% of people in cybersecurity were considering leaving the industry. Not, that's not leaving their job, leaving the industry. And I can tell you that uh, it hasn't been 85%, uh, but it's been a significant percent of people actually made good on that. And so because of that, everyone's cybersecurity posture has been lowered. So if you think about that, who trains the new people if the people who were the old guard and knew how to do things and knew, and knew how to take care of problems aren't available anymore, how do you get that competency? And so this is an area where organizations are going to have to look to things like orchestration to help them fill the void so that they don't burn out the remaining talent they have left. And so hopefully your organization has been pursuing a zero trust strategy so that you have visibility into what's going on in your network. And then you can leverage that data that you're observing to then use orchestration to address some of those dull, boring and dangerous and repetitive problems that keep happening so that your blue team can rest on that and do more of what humans do and not what robots can be made to do. So let's dive into that a little bit more and look at security orchestration. Alex, how would you define security orchestration? Yeah, that's a good question um, because it does mean slightly different things to different people, but I think security or orchestration tools are really there to integrate all the other security tools companies have. And we know that 
Um, small companies can have uh, up to 10 to 12 different security tools, medium-sized companies up to 30, and enterprise customers oftentimes have over 50 uh, security products that they leverage. And so a security orchestration tool integrates many of these pro products together into a central console. It allows the security ops team to centrally coordinate activities and the response to threats. It, it facilitates the integration of uh, traffic and information between the various products, the data transfer. Uh, it, it facilitates remote execution of commands that can run, uh, execute recoveries of servers or uh, resetting a network port, et cetera. So security orchestration is that, think of it as the commander who sits up, uh, up high up in the air and he's controlling all the other pieces on the ground. Okay, that's great, Alex. So what are some examples, maybe Brett, you could can share some types of processes and tools which are integrated together. So what are, what are some of those? Certainly integration of your knowledge of what's going on in your network. So uh, a SIM tool or an XDR type solution, XDR being, you know, one of the many different flavors of, of DR that are there. Those tools are going to help you out um, having a, a, an intelligent uh, pr uh, understanding of all of the things that are happening within your logs, having a longer log retention strategy, having things that will audit that. Uh, and then of course you need to augment all of those things with threat intelligence. Uh, you know, I use the example uh, of, you know, if you're in a military base and there's a giant truck that pulls up outside and the truck driver jumps out and runs away, um, some people would say, "Ha, huh, that's an odd place to park. An experienced person would say that person is probably trying to bomb us right now, right? So if it doesn't matter that you have the ability to observe if you don't have the ability to recognize what's happening, right? So that's exactly where threat intelligence can play a big role in helping you to say, oh, you know what, that's not a good thing. We need to do something to protect ourselves. Um, but then, of course, you're going to want to be doing constant assessment of where are my vulnerabilities? what's changed. And with all of the turmoil and all of the, the lift and shift stuff that's been going on over the last two years, um, there are a large number of seams that were likely opened up in our cybersecurity strategy. So you're probably incrementally been moving backwards and now it's time to reestablish by understanding what your threats are. But there are many other things that are out, that are out there, right, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's so many areas uh, of security technology you could integrate into an orchestration solution. And you covered several with SIM solutions and log management and threat intelligence. Others um, that I think integrate well would be endpoint solutions. As an endpoint detects some sort of ransomware or malware on an endpoint device, it sends it up to a security orchestration engine that then could respond by maybe shutting off that laptop or re-imaging re, uh, it possibly. Network security appliances are, are commonly integrated into a uh, orchestration engine because you could auto turn off ports if you need to, if you notice that a, a particular network ports being used for exfiltration of data, as an example. Uh, email and web gateways could be integrated so that if you get a phishing email, we could respond with some sort of automation. Ticketing systems could be integrated so you could launch a, a ticket to have IT re-image a device manually, you know, if, if needed. Um, there's lots and lots of really cool areas of security that we think of typically separately as separate products. But when you think of security orchestration, you, you want to start imagining how could you leverage these tools together to accomplish a bigger workflow and, and to save time from the security operators, as you mentioned earlier, Brett, you know, we, we have fewer and fewer of those nowadays. And so the more time savings we can give those guys, the, the more they can spend time doing really important things like threat hunting. Simplification is another big trend that we're seeing at TD Cynix. And that the reason why is because uh, everybody that's on the blue team needs things to be simpler. They need less places to go to find out what they're looking for. So as a subtext of orchestration, uh, simplification. So one thing we're seeing is a stronger um, interest in ecosystem type plays. So some of those vendors that carry a larger ecosystem of products allow you to centralize through their own unification, if you will, efforts. And so uh, think of simplification as a supporting element of orchestration for your organization. You know, one of the, the things that I hear commonly when people are trying to discuss security orchestration is security automation. I think there's a little confusion on that. Maybe, Alex, you could just explain briefly the difference between security orchestration versus security automation. Yeah, that's, that's an actually interesting topic because I think a lot of people use the term orchestration and automation interchangeably. And I would argue that they're a little bit different. 
Security orchestration tools involve both people, process, and technology because the technology, of course, does the automation part, and that's what security automation is. But security orchestration involves process development because you first need to define what is the process I'm going to go through if I get a phishing email. I need to not only run through some technology steps, but I also need to think about who do I need to notify and uh, is there any disclosure required? And there, there's a lot of process involved there, some of which can be automated, some of which will always be manual. And then the people side of that is training your people to actually understand the orchestration and potentially be a part of it. Because as I mentioned, sometimes orchestration involves more than just automated steps. Sometimes there's manual steps and people need to be trained and involved in doing that. When we say security automation, we literally mean the execution of steps. And oftentimes in, in the security world, we call those run books or playbooks. Uh, any good SOC will, will know what that means. And that's just those steps that you would run through. Sometimes they're manual, sometimes they're automated. But when it comes to automation, the playbook is a set of technology things like log into this device and run this command and grab the output and bring it back and then scan it for a keywords and then do a lookup in a vulnerability database to see if the data is there. Like all those kind of technology steps can be automated through a run book so that the human doesn't have to do them and take their time away from more productive activities. You know, th this whole concept um, really came more into play a few years ago when we started hearing terms like SOAR, security orchestration and automated um, response. Uh, response, thank you. So that, that whole concept is really about automate, it's security automation uh, tied into a SIM or something that feeds it information so that we can then execute uh, some type of automation and save time. Yeah, absolutely. So runbooks, for example, help your team manage the details. So if you think about having a cybersecurity incident, it's never a calm operation where somebody says, you know, I say, I think someone's broken into our network. Oh, well, we should get them out of here. Uh, it's not a light discussion like that. It's usually your hair's on fire, there's urgency, there's a problem. Uh, and so because of that, a detail or a lot of things can be overlooked and there are a lot of opportunities that are missed. So having a run book or a uh, playbook allows your team to, if nothing else, run through a checklist of all the things that you do in relation to the incidents. Now that's the manual side of this. But of course, there are so many of these things going on all the time. You need something like SOAR, uh, which is security, orchestration, automated response. The automated response portion is, yep, we observe this thing. It's a problem. And we're going to do all these steps to deal with, to remediate with that. There might still be manual steps around that or even through it or even at the end of that. But the fact is, is the more that you can uh, turn over to automated systems, likely better off your team is certainly the less stress your team's going to be because they don't have to do literally everything to deal with every situation. So let's look at that a little further. So, you know, to play off of what you just said, Brett, what are some examples of tasks performed by stock operators or security specialists that would be helped by security orchestration? Yeah, there are so many. And so as an example, phishing, right? So uh, we see a phishing email, we recognize it as a phishing email, it went to 50 of our people in the organization. Um, you can use automation and orchestration to go in and manually remove that email from everybody's inbox. So chances are you'll get it before they're even able to open it up. And because of that, if you think about it, you've just taken the human decision-making process out of it. You've left it to an expert to say, well, that's phishing. We got to get rid of that. And then it just removes it automatically from your user's inboxes. So you don't have to count on 50 people making the exact right decision. So that's one example. And of course, endpoint, um, when you have a virus or your things like that, you can absolute ransomware starts kicking off. You can begin to isolate. You can shut down systems. There are a lot of things that you could do to prevent further damage to your organization. And that can be something that executes like, wow, I clicked on the wrong thing. Wow, it looks like it's locked out my files. Hey, let's capture, just do a memory grab and then shut the system down so it stops. So that's just a couple of examples. I'm sure there are more. Yeah, I can think of a couple more. So another good one is vulnerability management. So a good vulnerability tool will scan your environment looking for known vulnerabilities in your network and your servers and your endpoint devices. But when it finds a vulnerability, the question is, what do you do next? So a security orchestration uh, run book could ingest that vulnerability information that comes out of the tool and then possibly enrich that data with some external data from maybe the CVE database. 
CV stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. It is a public database of all known vulnerabilities in the market. There's a lot of good information out there about known vulnerabilities, like uh, where the source of it came from, steps you would take to remediate that vulnerability, et cetera. So you could automate pulling data from the CVE database and enriching your information. Then maybe you query your, your um, data vulnerability tool to, to see if it has any additional information, uh, diagnostic information or any remediation steps they recommend. Then you could even calculate the severity of the vulnerability by looking at all this intelligence that you can pull through automation. So that's, that's one example. Another thought that comes to mind is threat hunting. So threat hunting can be a very manual process where a human sits down and tries to identify bad guys on the network and uh, as they pivot around. But you can automate some of that. For instance, if you take a threat feed subscription and a threat feed is really just a huge list of indicators of compromise. An indicator of compromise might be a, a hash of a file that's known to have malware in it, or it might be a IP address of a known bad website um, you could ingest those indicators of compromise and then auto scan your environment to see, is there any sign of that IOC in your environment? And if there is, you might want to open, send an alert to your SIM tool or open a ticket in a trouble ticketing system, you know, anything like that. Um, all of this is automation that, that would take a human 30 minutes to do, but could take the machine, you know, under a minute to do uh, in many cases and save a tremendous amount of time and give you visibility to an incident quick enough that you could respond before something bad happens, hopefully. Yeah, I'd like to echo that statement. I mean, if you have uh, tools that will automatically do a lot of the manual labor that your threat hunting team has to do, collects that data and brings it back to you in a spot, you're going to dramatically increase or uh, create a force magnifying uh, capability within your organization, which if you think about it, as threats escalate, can you can you honestly say you're going to go out and hire a bunch more threat intelligence people? Or do you think you need to make the threat intelligence people you have more effective at their jobs? Probably both, but certainly the people that are there have to be more effective. So let's say an organization is, is bought in. They're saying, I want to do security orchestration. It makes sense. So what are, what are the steps involved to deploy it effectively or properly? Well, there's several. Um, first of all, you need to obviously pick a technology stack that you want to use to center your orchestration around. And there picking the right technology stack means picking one that has the right integrations available because not all orchestration tools are equal. Um, they all have different integrations to different type tools. There, there are several categories of tools I would pay particular attention to in terms of integration ability, monitoring and detection tools, that's integration into your SIM that you use, your log management system, that's gonna be important because that's where a lot of the alerts are gonna be. Uh, integration into a data enrichment tool or intelligence tools like uh, threat intelligence offerings, subscription or otherwise, uh, malware analysis tools. Um, a third would be in enforcement or response tools. These are things like endpoint or firewalls or email gateways, anything that detects an alert and then can enforce that alert by shutting off a service or a port or something. And fourth, you wanna look for uh, orchestration technologies that integrate with supporting tools like ticketing systems and email systems and chat bots and things like that, because those can all be helpful in an instant response exercise. So once you pick your technology stack, you then have to go configure all these integrations because they're not going to happen out of the box. And then most importantly, you're going to want to um, really define the processes in those run books so that you can then start configuring automations. A lot of this orchestration tools will come with some default automations and run books with some of their common integrations, but most every company will need to customize that to your needs based on your processes and procedures and uh, how you do things. So th those are a couple of ideas around what a project could look like. A lot of it can be done internally by your own staff and sometimes you'll need to go external. Well, and certainly you're going to have to uh, do a lot around the process of configuring those tools. You know, you're going to have to evaluate um, the roles and privileges that your remediation has and, and the things that it can do. And then, of course, you're going to have to make sure that you set up that process. Hopefully, you're also documenting that in your run book so that if somebody had to do it manually, they could augment it or take over where the robots failed. Uh, and, and if you think about the blend of all of that stuff, what you're really doing is you're saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna look for these types of things and we're going to do the things we need to be able to observe it because you cannot fight what you cannot see, right? And then we're going to then uh, 
create a, create a solution stack that's going to help us get this done. We're going to configure that stack. We're going to make sure that we evaluate the privileges so we don't create more cybersecurity risk, but it also has the right capabilities that we need to get this done. We're going to set up a process and some documentation around that. But ultimately, you have to make sure that you have it defined and documented. And that is critical because as we move forward into a more regulatory environment, if you do not have your processes documented, you can get double dinged for that. You can suffer a major problem and get fined by everybody and have all kinds of terrible things happen to you. But then another round of regulatory entities can come in and say, well, you didn't have any documentation for this. You had no process around this. And because of that, you are now going to pay additional set of fines and additional set of losses. So it's really quite critical that you do all of those things uh, as part of your solution for implementing SOAR. And so what, what are the real benefits of security orchestration? Let's dive into that because I know there's some key key real benefits if you take the steps to implement this. Well, for one thing, again, you're going to know, right? So you're going to be able to accelerate your incident response. I mean, uh, it, one of those statistics that should drive everybody crazy is the average dwell time is still over 200 days. That means somebody broke into your house and they're there 200 days before you notice that they're there. That is crazy. That's a, it's just a, such a, a difficult thing to metabolize mentally because of the fact that uh, all of that time is risk to your organization. And if you don't think about that and say, well, what's the big deal? I tell you what, if you don't think that's a big deal, give me the keys to your house and don't come back for 200 days and then find out what Brett did to you. Like that should just terrify the living heck out of you, right? So and I'm the nice guy, forget, I'm not the really bad guy. Uh, and so uh, because of that, you're really going to have to think about how you're going to implement this, but accelerate your ability to respond. And every the, every minute that you trim off that dwell time, you are dramatically improving the the, uh, be the beneficial effect uh, and minimizing the, the negative consequences to your organization when you have an incident. And then of course, um, because you're using SOAR, you're also standardizing how you deal with things. You're documenting, you're being able to scale the process. So if a whole bunch <laughs> more of these things happen, um, everything that is automatable can scale with technology rather than competent human beings, which are getting harder and harder to find, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, but the, uh, the other side to this is uh, you are building out a more responsive infrastructure for your security. And that, of course, can lead to uh, a lot of uh, discoveries about what's working well and what's working poorly on your network. Yeah, but it is all focused on the functional execution of your organization and reducing and minimizing costs associated with that. So all of these things are incredibly healthy processes, but there are more. Yeah, I agree with all those benefits. Uh, I would add to that list maybe uh, an increase in productivity from the security staff. Uh, if you just think about at, at the face of it, if you can take things that would take a human 30 minutes to do and get it down to a minute for the computer, obviously that's a benefit in productivity for the staff. And, and particularly so that they can spend time doing things like threat hunting, as we talked about earlier. Another good benefit is um, for the customer who's invested a lot of money in a lot of different security products, security orchestration is not trying to replace or upset what a customer's already invested in. It's trying to leverage it to its full potential. Because while endpoint security on its own is really helpful and good, when you can integrate it with your SIM solution and integrate it with threat intelligence feed, you really start to enhance the value of the investment you've already made. Uh, and, and lastly, I would just say, it absolutely improves the overall security posture of the organization. Because when you add orchestration, not just automation, but orchestration, you are thinking about all the processes in your organization to look at all the ways bad guys get into the network and into your email and into your cloud workloads and trying to orchestrate remediation of incidents when you find them so it happens quickly so that you don't have a 200 day dwell time of the bad guy in your network, which would be a huge win, of course. So I know there's a lot of myths out there as well about security orchestration and the effects that it can have on your business. So I'm curious to get your guys' take on a few of these. Brett, I'll start with you. Security orchestration will replace your security team. What is, what is your response to that myth? Yeah, it's laughably not true. Uh, but if you think about it, you know, fear and uh, ignorance breeds, uh, you know, poor decisions. And so if people say, well, gosh, if everything's automated, then why do they need me? And uh, there's a real simple answer for that. 
humans are really good at human related stuff. And that's the kind of things that we can't really make technology do. So what you need to do is you need to offload the things that technology can do for you so that you have brain power left to do what you do. Otherwise, there really is no case. So not using orchestration is the fastest way to replace a uh, security team, right? Because again, if everybody's fried out, they can't do what humans do, then the business says, I'm paying for all these humans, they can't do anything for me, let's just go with the automation. So the fact is, is that it is the combination of two, the human assets doing what humans do, the technology assets doing what technology does, that's what makes effective cybersecurity. Neither one replaces the other. Here, here's another one, Alex, maybe you can comment on this myth. Security orchestration is just a fancy term for a SIM. Yeah, that, interestingly, I think that the two are coming together faster and faster. Uh, I know a lot of the legacy SIM providers, the IBMs, the microfocuses, the Splunks, they, they are acquiring SOAR vendors right now. Uh, several acquisitions have happened just in the last few months because they wanna to continue to add more capability to their SIM. Generally speaking, a SIM is just a data collector of information from around the network and then correlating that information into a few alerts that can be acted upon. But most SIMs don't have that auto remediation. That's what SOAR or security orchestration adds to the equation. I think we are moving, the two concepts are moving closer to closer together in the vendor community. And we will continue to see more and more automation uh, and run books baked into the SIM solutions in the market. I think it's probably natural for that to happen over time. Uh, we've heard a lot of, of a term called XDR, uh, which we've talked about on other podcasts, but this extended detection and response is sort of that idea of pulling in multiple domains of security, endpoint security, network security, email security, and then correlating information and then automating a response to it. You know, XDR and security orchestration and SIM are becoming harder and harder to kind of define and tell apart, but they, they are different still at the moment. Brett, what do you think about the myth that security orchestration is only meant for large enterprises? Well, if you think about it, um, that it's probably the inverse of that that's true. Like large organizations typically have more budget, more people, and so forth and so on. So they can try to human attack the problem. Still a failing strategy, but they have the resourcing to do that. Uh, the fact is, is that regardless of the size of your organization, I mean, 43% of attacks in 2019 were against small business. There's a reason why they're attacking small business, because it's easier to take you down than it is to take down the bigger guys. And they'll bring you down so that they can get into the bigger guys through the, through the pathways that were made for you. So again, uh, a smaller organization or anyone that has resource constraints, frankly, that's everybody, but it is more so with the smaller uh, business side of the spectrum, you absolutely need to leverage orchestration to make up for your inability to find and, um, and retrain, retain the talent that you need. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you're having to deal with one or two people that are fighting off a level of cyber threats that normal organizations that have 50 or more are taking care of. All of those things suggest that if you are a smaller organization, so any, anyone on the lower end of the spectrum, your need to utilize SOAR actually is higher than those organizations that have, are, have a high human resource capital. But to be, to be perfectly blunt, everyone is in this game and everyone suffers, big or small. I know that as we're kind of wrapping up here, there's probably have time for one more. I know there's a bunch more myths, but Maybe Alex, touch on the uh, the myth that security orchestration is only for reactive processes. Well, that's pretty natural. I mean, security analysts don't have a lot of time to be proactive, so they are naturally reactive. So when they think of security orchestration, they're thinking of orchestrating and automating reactive actions like we've talked about before. If you get an endpoint security ransomware on an endpoint device, go wipe and reimage the device. That's a reactive posture. But the truth is security orchestration can absolutely be used to be proactive as well. An example is running health checks on the environment, like set up some run books that will go, as we talked about earlier, pull down indicators of compromise from uh, some, some intelligence feeds and then scan your network to see if you're vulnerable. Or maybe you could do various threat hunting tasks, um, running around looking for signs that there's uh, exfiltration of data on the network or command and control connections uh, out to known bad IP addresses. So there are, there are absolutely ways that um, security orchestration could and should be used 
proactively, but I do understand how a lot of people think initially of being reactive because unfortunately that's that endless loop that most security analysts are stuck in. So I'd like to support that by saying the reason why a lot of people on the blue team feel as though they're always reactive is because they don't have orchestration working for them because they don't have SOAR. They have to do everything, which because humans can't keep up with the scale of computers, they're always reacting. So that's exactly you're, you're, you're touching the, the touch point that caused the 85 percent of people saying in the blue team, I want to leave my job because I hate losing every day. Orchestration is one of those things that changes that perception because now they can get back onto the more uh, more on the top side and less on the losing side of the equation. And with that, I know that we are, we're pretty much out of time here, but does either of you have anything you want to say just as we close this out? Any last thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I have one closing thought, I guess, for everyone. As you start thinking about how would you position security orchestration solutions with your customers, um, there's a, the, the most important component of orchestration is the integration with all the other tools in the environment. And as you might imagine, it is very difficult to integrate 50 tools into an orchestration tool versus integrating one vendor suite where it's an integrated vendor. So this is an argument for focusing on security vendors who have a large set of tools that are, um, that are integrated together. I'll give you one simple example. This isn't a plug per se, but you know, Fortinet has what they call the fabric. And what that means is their email security, their network security, their endpoint security, everything kind of communicates with each other. So when an event is found in one, it communicates it to the other so that there's already integration there, which makes orchestration so much simpler when you're going with a vendor who has a lot of technology integrated. Cisco is the same way. They have an integrated fabric of lots of tools that already talk together, which gets you farther down the orchestration road without all the work of having to individually integrate every single tool who speaks a different language and operates in a different way with different sets of APIs. So um, as partners, you know, think about when you're designing your security infrastructure for your customer uh, of picking fewer vendors that have more solutions in their portfolio because the integration will, will be simpler. And with that, we'll wrap this up because I know we're out of time. Thank you both for your participation on this call and hopefully the audience got a lot out of this and uh, we'll hopefully have a, another interesting topic for you next month on 30 Minutes with Hacker. Thanks everybody for joining.